Hi there, it's Pastor Days with another midweek message for you. I hope you're having a great week, and I hope Christ is first in everything that you do. We've been studying here in the middle of the week the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter number 5, and I hope you bring your Bible and open it up and follow along as I read today. In Matthew chapter number 5, one of the most famous passages um, in the Bible, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And here we find those beatitudes, those lists of blessings uh, that God gives us. And that word blessing, it means happy. So when we read things like, blessed are the poor in spirit, the Bible's telling us that they're happy. Happy to be poor in spirit. Happy uh, to be meek. Happy to be hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And, uh, and, and so the, this should bring happiness in our lives, that this is a part of us. Because this is essential. These are good things that we experience. And I know oftentimes the blessings of God don't look like blessings to begin with, but they are. And so join me here as we read Matthew chapter number 5, verses 1 through 12. And uh, and let's look at these Beatitudes, and we'll come back and, and uh, focus on one in particular here today. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. As we look at these Beatitudes, we see a spiritual progression. And remember, uh, this is all, all the Beatitudes have a spiritual application. And certainly we look at some of these things, we say, well, we're talking about hungry and thirsty, and we're talking about being poor. Those are physical things. Well, no, the, the application here is always spiritual. And so remember that as we study those. The first beatitude that we looked at was in verse number three. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And, uh, and there's this idea that if we recognize our spiritual poverty, it is so essential. We, we are poor. We are, we are sinners before God. We are spiritually in poverty. Blessed are they that mourn. And once again, a spiritual application would be to mourn over, over sin and the consequences of sin. And when we mourn death, we're mourning the consequences of sin. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Here is this abandonment of pride, this abandonment of self-justification. I cannot save myself. I cannot meet my own needs. And there's this humility in meekness that's there. And, uh, and recognizing that grace is necessary, that God's gift is essential. And there's meekness is essential in our lives. And then verse number 6 talks about those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Because when you identify your poverty and, uh, and you mourn that spiritual poverty and, uh, and, and, and you are meek and humble and realize you cannot provide for yourself and you hunger and thirst after what God can give, after His righteousness, because you're spiritually poor and you hunger and thirst for His righteousness, the promise is given that you will be filled. And that filling is God's grace, God's mercy. And the next verse we come to says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And, uh, and here's the thought, and I want you to understand, this is not a trade. Uh, you don't give mercy so you can get mercy. Uh, that's, that's not mercy. Mercy's undeserved, and, and it's not earned. It's not paid for. And, uh, and so uh, the idea here is if you are merciful, it means you have received God's mercy. You understand mercy, and you've learned mercy, and now you can give mercy out because you've been blessed with mercy. And then so, too, there are others around. God will be uh, uh, work through others to provide mercy in our lives because that's God's promise. Is, is is that what you what you sow you will also reap 
And, uh, and so it's not a trade-off. We don't be merciful so that we can obtain mercy, but we understand this idea that there's blessings back from God when we're obedient to His will and His commands, and when we carry on His attributes. And mercy, mercy is one of those attributes of God. And, uh, and so now we come to verse number 8 today. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And uh, what a wonderful idea that is to be able to see God. Uh, and it's an amazing thought, an amazing idea. Uh, because um, to be honest with you, uh, you can't see God and live. That's that's boy, that's way back in the Old Testament. And so here's the idea: here we can see God, and uh, that's awesome. But it says you have to be pure in heart. And now that's a little bit scary. Uh, are our hearts pure? And what is the idea of pureness there? Because this is something that uh, uh, that's not easy to obtain. Purity. It's something that's easy to taint and it's easy to lose. And so how is it that we become pure? I think this is a verse that's oftentimes it's twisted and it's, and it's misused. And it does not mean those that are without sin. It does not mean those that have, have grown to the point to where they no longer face temptation and the allurement of the world is no longer a part of their lives. Because let's be honest, that we don't come to that point in a fleshly body, in a wicked world. We're not going to come to the point to where there are no fleshly allurements in this world. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we say that we're not sinners and we don't sin then the truth is not in us and understand what that verse is saying there it says if we say that we have no sin and that word have it is present tense it's not just i have never sinned but i currently am free from all sin god says no 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 the truth's not in you if you try to say you still don't battle sin you still don't give into temptation the truth is not in you, if that's what you're saying. And so here's the truth of the matter. All of us are sinners, and we go through God's Word, and we see that again and again. We know Noah, after he got off the ark, he got drunk. We know that Moses disobeyed God and lost the ability to lead Israel into the promised land. David committed adultery and even murder. Uh, and God had called him a man after his own heart. And, uh, and in the New Testament, Peter denied Christ after having followed him as an apostle for years. And, um, and then even Paul talks about his struggles with sin as well, his struggles with the flesh. And so, folks, if you say that you are above and beyond sin and above and beyond temptation, the truth, God says, is not in you. And, uh, and, and, and you're definitely not going to be superior in any way spiritually to these individuals we just talked about. To where you've moved beyond sin that's not possible and when we look at this list and we think about these individuals moses and david and noah and and uh, and paul and peter uh, these individuals that struggled with sin in their lives let's be honest it should be humbling to us and, uh, and and in a way it should be you know well hey listen i'm not alone we should recognize that but also it should be humbling that uh, that we're still gonna have to face these battles we're gonna have to fight these battles and yet we come back to our passage and it says, Blessed are the pure in heart. And if I'm still going to have to battle sin, how can I be pure in heart? So what does it mean to be pure in heart? And what does it mean to see God? And, uh, and let's talk about this. We'll break this down a little bit. Let's identify, first of all, the, the heart. When the Bible talks about the heart, what is the Bible talking about? Of course, not this physical organ that is beating and pumping blood uh, through our veins. That's not literally what it's talking about, but it's talking about something deeper. And of course, we use the word heart as well to talk about uh, love or about emotion, something more than just the physical. And so too, in a spiritual aspect, we're looking at something deeper and more important than just the physical organ that beats in our heart. When we talk about the heart biblically and spiritually, we're talking about the center of man's being uh, spiritually and personally. We're talking about the heart of who we are, our personality. That's the heart of man. And uh, not just the emotions, that's a part of it, but the will and the intellect. This is all the heart of man. And, uh, and so it's the center of mankind, but it's also the center of wickedness in man. And Jesus points that out, is that, that wickedness and sin, it's not just a physical thing, an outward thing. As a matter of fact, the physical thing, it's just an expression of the inward. 
Jesus said in Matthew 15, verses 18 through 19, But those things which, are, which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Listen, those physical things that we do that we call sin, that hurt others and that hurt God, those things, they come from someplace. They come from the heart of man. That's the center, the source of wickedness and depravity in man. And, uh, and so you think about what are we putting inside of our hearts and inside of our lives? That certainly has a part. But listen, folks, our hearts are themselves in this fallen creature, in, in this fallen being that we are, our will is easily turned towards wickedness without too much work. And so the heart, it's the center of man's being and intellect and personality. It is the center of sin and depravity in man, uh, but it is also the center of Christ's teaching. That is where his focus is at. He focuses on the heart of man. The heart is what we are. It is the heart that needs to change. Understand this. We looked at that list there in Matthew 15. Jesus talks about, uh, about murders and, and evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witness and blasphemies. If you don't want people to be adulterous and, and thieves and liars and blasphemers, you don't just stop the outward actions. You got to stop the heart. You got to change the heart. And if we want to be better people in an outward sense, we've got to be better people on the inward sense. The Bible says in Mark 7, 6, Jesus is speaking here. He says, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The heart needs to be closer to God. The heart needs that purity and that cleansing. And that'll change the outward actions. We need to do some work to clean up the heart. And so you think, what does it take to change a man? And you might know people in your life. And, and it might be you, you're struggling in, with sin and wickedness and bad habits and, and there's things in your life that maybe you call them addictions, whether it be to alcohol or to drugs or to tobacco or to pornography or to gambling. And these things have a hold of your life. How do you change those? It's not just, it's not just restricting yourself and cutting yourself off from these outward things. It's changing your heart. God wants to change your heart. God wants your heart to be closer to Him. That's why he said, talks about the people, the people's hearts being far from him. He wants their hearts close to him. That changes a man. That changes a woman. That changes a person when their heart is close to God. So that's what the heart is about. The center of man, the center of wickedness, the center of Christ's teaching, where he's trying to get to. And so let's talk about what it means to be pure, to be pure in heart. The idea of purity, first of all, it's talking about cleansing because the filthy, because wickedness, because sin cannot enter into the perfect presence of God. Folks, we cannot walk into heaven in our sin and depravity. We cannot walk into perfection with sin and depravity in our lives because it'll deprave and it'll, it'll dirty up. It'll make filthy that which is perfect and clean. So there has to be this cleansing, this purity is essential. And all of us have this sin and depravity. In the Bible's clear in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Each of us are sinners. There is none righteous, no, not one. And it is our sin that's caused us to come up short of God's glory and of God's presence. And so that's why we need to be made clean. We need the cleansing. We need the purity. And this purity comes from Jesus Christ. He's the one that saves us, that cleanses us, that washes us, that allows us to be able to be in the presence of God. It's through Christ. In Hebrews 9, verses 13 through 14, the Bible tells us, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the pure fine of the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god folks it is because of jesus christ's sacrifice and and the blood of the bulls and the goats and the heifers those sacrifices that were made in the old testament they had to be made again and again and again but we find here the sacrifice of jesus christ the blood of christ he died once and he died for all and that was enough to cleanse us to to, to purge our conscience to make us clean to stand before god and uh, we need we need his cleansing in our lives for salvation first and foremost and understand this is that as a christian as a believer uh you know our sin is not going to uh, remove us from god even though we fall into sin and and we can 
and find that to be true of the individuals that we talked about. We, you know, we looked at Noah and his sin, and we looked at Moses and his sin. We looked at David and Peter and and uh, and and Paul, and all these men battled with sin, and and uh, and they struggled with this. But God never forsook them. God never gave up on them. God never cast them out of His family, or, or stopped having a relationship with them, or stopped using them. But yet you find that these men, they had to come to God in repentance and find forgiveness and ask God to forgive them of their sins. Not because it altered their relationship with God as a father and child, but it did hinder their fellowship with God. And folks, the same is true for us. Our sin today does not alter the fact that we are still God's children but it'll change our fellowship with God. So we come to God walking in this dirty world, walking in the filth here of this world, and in our own sin and depravity as well. You know, we need to come back to God and find forgiveness. And in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's true of salvation. But folks, it's true for us as Christians. We need to come back to God and confess our sin and ask Him to cleanse us and to forgive us of that sin. And so there is this purity, there's this cleansing, I'm sorry, with this purity, this purity, your heart is a heart that's been cleansed by God and it's a heart that we're striving to keep clean as well because once again that sin in our lives it is it is it is a um, it, it mars our fellowship with God we're not going to see him when we're indulging in sin even though we're his children and you think about that human relationship of a father and a child and that child rebels it's going to hinder the fellowship now that child is still going to be the child of the father the father's still going to love that child in spite of his rebellion against him. But yet you find there is a hindrance in that fellowship. And he may not have all the same blessings that he had before. He may not have the same closeness with the father that he had before until that's forgiven and restored. And folks, we need to be pure in heart with God. We need to find his purity in salvation. But also, we need to maintain a good relationship with God. And when we mess up, find forgiveness. And so there's this idea of cleansing when we talk about purity. But there's this, also this idea of focus and singleness. We talk about being pure. There is this singleness. And, and you are following God and God alone. And you love God and God alone. And there's this, this the idea of, of this singleness is purity. And it doesn't mean you don't love absolutely anything else, but you're worshiping one God, you're serving one God. And, and He's the one you're seeking to please and to follow. And folks, we are so easily divided. We are so easily split. And, 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 uh, and, and folks, let's be honest, so many, so many of us today, so many Christians today, we wear two faces. We'll come into church on Sunday. And we'll be the good Christian. We'll have our Bible tucked under our arm and we'll say all the right things and, and smile at the right times and say amen at the right points in the, in the service. But folks, we know when we turn around and walk out the door, we're not living for Christ. He's not number one in our lives. And we live duplicit lives and, 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 and we're being deceptive. And folks, there is a, purity means there is a singleness, there is a focus. We're seeking to serve Christ, and He's the one that has our heart, and He's the one we're seeking to please. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14-18, through 18, the Bible tells us, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He says, listen, we need to be not unequally yoked together, but focused and pure on Christ. Make sure He's number one in our lives. We can't be unequally yoked with others. So purity, it means there's a cleansing at salvation, a continued cleansing in our lives as we as Christians fall into sin and make mistakes. And there's also this purity, this focus on God, this singleness on Him. And there's this wonderful promise that when we are pure in heart, we get to see God. 
What a wonderful thought. I mentioned before, no man can see God and live. That's what the Old Testament tells us. But yet we do get to experience the presence of God. We do get to experience uh, uh, Him in our lives. And of course, that's true at salvation. When we get saved, we develop and have a relationship with Him. And, and, and Jesus says the Spirit dwells in us. And, uh, and as we get to know Him better, we see Him more and more. Uh, we see Him in the creation, in the world around us. You can see God's hand at work in this marvelous creation. I know there's some that believe in evolution. They believe that all this world happened by pure chance, and and I can't help but laugh and mock at the order and the the uh, the, the 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 complicated world in which we live, and and to think it's just oh it happened by random chance. I'll tell you what, it is not random. It is the work of a creator that formed and shaped this world, and uh, just as it was the uh, the the work of a creator that shaped and built the home that you live in with its very Various complex systems, um, uh, uh, whether it be the electrical system and the plumbing system and, and the heating and cooling system. And, and uh, it didn't happen by chance. You don't randomly come across a home that randomly has all these systems that integrate and work together to provide a perfect living experience. Uh, so too, mankind and this creation that so perfectly works together. It doesn't happen by random chance. It's not just randomly formed. God formed this world. And if you look at the nature, the natural world around us, we ought to appreciate it. We ought to love it. We ought to take care of it and recognize that it's God's hand that's at work there. And so in, at uh, uh, at salvation, there's there's an experience with God. Um, in, in nature, we get to see God's hand working as he continues to work in our lives. Christian, I'll tell you something, the more that you're yielded to him, the more that you're open to hearing his word, and the more that you speak back to him in prayer, the more that you're obedient to him and being in his house and being a witness for him and, and, and continuing to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to seek to do his will in your life, you're going to more and more and more see his hand working in your life. You're going to be able to recognize his blessings, his punishment. And as you seek to draw closer to him, as your heart gets closer to God, you're going to see God working in your life more and more and one day we'll get to see him face to face one day we'll get to stand in God's presence one day we'll get to worship him in these mortal fleshly bodies we could not see God and live but one day praise the Lord we'll be able to stand in heaven one day we'll get to see Jesus face to face I love 1st John 3 verses 1 and 2 behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When we get to see Jesus Christ, the Bible says we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. And what a wonderful day that will be to be able to see God. Let me encourage you today, though. You can see God in this world. You can experience Him at work today. But let's make sure our hearts are close to Him. Let's make sure our hearts are pure and clean. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, He wants to clean up your life. He wants to cleanse you and give you new, a new family and give you a new home in heaven. And He wants to make all things new. Invite Jesus to come into your heart and save you today. If you're a Christian today, folks, we all stumble into sin. Turn to God and find forgiveness. Confess that sin. Repent of that sin and ask Him to forgive you. And let's have that singleness of heart seeking to please Him, keeping Him first in our lives. Let's keep our hearts close to God by being in His Word and being obedient to Him, spending time in prayer, doing His will and not our own. And folks, look for God to be working and moving in the world around us, in your hearts and lives. I want you to experience God. I want you to see God today because he wants to reveal himself to you. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for your precious word. Thank you for all these beatitudes. But thank you, dear Lord, for this promise to be able to see you. And I just pray, dear Lord, for that one that's never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Today would be that day of salvation. You'd cleanse their hearts, dear Lord, and uh, make them a part of your family. And allow them to experience you, dear Lord, for the first time. And I pray to Heavenly Father for Christians that we turn to you for cleansing and forgiveness. We choose to follow after you and walk after you. We keep our hearts close to you. And dear Lord, help us to experience you in our lives, dear Lord, day to day, in our workplaces, in our times of reading your word. And dear Lord, I just pray that through this simple message today, 
that people would hear and understand and see God and that they might just accept you and your cleansing, your forgiveness, your salvation, your desire to love them and walk with them. And I pray, dear Lord, for your will to be done in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you. And we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.